fast. Okay, so welcome to our December in uh, the garden talk or December in your garden talk. And thank you for joining us. We're a few minutes late to get started due to technical issues. So I'm gonna sort of rush through these or go through these first slides quickly. If you'd like to listen to a recording of this presentation, we'll put it on the recent presentations tab that's on our website on the left-hand side of our website. Um, it's a drop-down tab there. Um, so you can find it along with a resource sheet that we'll post um, and give us about 24 hours to get those posted and those should be up. I went ahead and turned off all the cameras and um, if you could turn off your microphones um, when they're not in use, that would be great. Just to reduce background noise, if you have any questions Feel free to unmute yourself as we go along. And you can also save um, the chat. We'll drop the links for the um, from the presentation at the end of the chat. And if you're on a desktop or a laptop, you should be able to save the chat as well. So you can get the links from the chat or, oh, I've lost my cursor. There it is. Let's see. Oh. I think the weather is dooming my internet today. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, well, we're just moving through. Oh. Okay. And as Debbie shared, oh, PowerPoint closed. Goodness gracious. <laughs> What's wrong with PowerPoint? Um, so I'll just, I'll go through our introduction slides while I reopen the PowerPoint. Um, so we're the San Bernardino County Master Gardeners. We're part of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And we are a group of uh, trained volunteers who like to share resources, peer reviewed research and resources from the University of California and other universities throughout the state and country and the world. And we love talking about sustainable landscaping, better living through gardening and growing food. That's our main focuses in the county. Our um, county cooperative extension office has the master gardener program. It also has the master food preserver program. 4-H is a program out of our county office and also a nutrition program, FNEP. So together we all work to get peer reviewed research out to members of the community. And each county has a cooperative extension program and has a master gardener program. So in our county, we have special knowledge of our county and our different microclimates. And so today's presentation will be um, definitely focused on our county. And um, part of our San Bernardino County master gardener program as part of the program or one of our projects is a seed library. So we have um, a seed library program where we have seeds that we share with the public before COVID, we had a couple of locations in, one was in Yucaipa and one was in uh, Montclair and we shared seeds at those locations. And since the pandemic, we sort of expanded beyond those locations to sharing seeds at community gardens and events. And we're looking forward to the new year to having a more of a mobile seed library. We do have a seed library Facebook page. Um, it's the San Bernardino Regional seed library and we'll start posting more on that page um, in the new year with more information about where our sort of pop-up seed library or mobile seed libraries will be and then as part of our seed saving education or our seed saving project we also do a lot of education on seed saving so we do a monthly topic this month we covered the basics of seed saving last month we did um, a presentation about pollination. Well, I guess it was two months ago, we did pollination traffic control. And last month we talked about seed saving from pumpkins and squashes. So a wide variety of topics on seed saving. So check this out if you're interested and we kind of rotate between specific topics and more general um, topics. So let's see, just have a couple of photos for our next part of the presentation. Now let's see if we can possibly get any of the technology to work today. Um, and so I wanna share with you just a little bit about citrus greening disease. 
And this is part of our December in the Garden presentation as well, because they've expanded the quarantine boundaries for this disease. If you haven't heard of it, it's a fatal citrus disease. It affects all members of uh, the citrus family. So all of the citrus fruits that we know and love, plus some other um, plants like orange jasmine and the Indian curry leaf. And it's a bacteria um, and it is, like I said, fatal to citrus, but it's not harmful to people. But when trees become infected, uh, they will die, unfortunately. The disease has been found all over Southern California. I'm trying to find my cursor. It's not happening today with my cursor or anything. Be lucky if we make it through the whole presentation. But anyways, this is a map of Southern California and the disease has been found um, within the blue lines. There we go, um, all over Southern California. Uh, just most recently on December 6th, they expanded the quarantine so you see this was the previous quarantine. Here's Riverside and East San Bernardino. And here is West San Bernardino and Orange County, Riverside County and Orange and LA counties. And now they've expanded it. They found some more insects or trees that were infected with this disease in Harupa and Riverside. This disease is spread. The mode of spread is through a small insect, the Asian citrus psyllid. And it's about the size of a half of a grain of rice. And as it moves throughout um, from tree to tree, it spreads the bacteria from tree to tree. So this insect is moving the disease around and the early symptoms of the disease will be this asymmetrical yellowing of the leaves. So you wanna be on the lookout for that. That's an early symptom that you might see if you have citrus trees. And later symptoms are this greening of the fruit the asymmetrical midline of the fruit and the brown aborted seeds. And eventually within about 10 years, the tree will die. It usually takes a couple of years for these symptoms to show up. So it's been a tricky disease to manage because it's several years before the tree is in, um, shows symptoms. And so what happens is, is that as the insect feeds on an infected tree, uh, then um, it will go on to the next tree and it will feed on that tree and spread the disease, spreading um, it from tree to tree as it travels, which I think I kind of said in the last slide. But again, here are the early symptoms of the disease followed by the later symptoms and then eventually the tree will die off. Florida doesn't have any backyard citrus anymore. It's been devastated by this disease. So we wanna prevent the spread of this disease. Um, and uh, take three easy steps to prevent the spread. So one is don't share stems and leaves when you're sharing fruit. Also during the holidays, sometimes um, people will share wreaths or Christmas swags or decorations, holiday decorations that have citrus leaves because they are so beautiful, but you can be spreading the insect without knowing it. You should also, it is recommended that you put citrus cuttings um, not in the green waste, but put them in the trash or compost them on site. And so the reason we're asking for these leaves not to be shared is if you remember that this insect is about the size of a half of a grain of rice, um, then its larvae are about half or a third its size and the eggs are even smaller. So when you're sharing fruit with stems and leaves, you might be unknowingly sharing this insect. Um, the same thing with uh, Christmas decorations or anything. So we don't want to be spreading this insect that might potent that could potentially be carrying the disease. Another thing we want to avoid is sharing cuttings. It takes a couple years for symptoms to show up in the tree and because of the way the disease moves through the tree, sometimes part of the tree can show symptoms or be more infected than other parts. So it's hard to tell if a tree is infected. So you don't wanna receive cuttings and be possibly bringing a diseased uh, wood onto your property. And you don't wanna share cuttings because you might be spreading a disease that you don't realize that you have on your property. If you're interested in citrus uh, cuttings and grafting, then there's a citrus clonal protection program and they have clean sources of budwood available. So check that out. And then the third step is you wanna keep ants out of your plants. The ants love to protect insects that excrete a sugar or honeydew solution. So things like aphids, scale, this tiny insect that um, spreads this disease, they all excrete a honeydew solution. 
And the ants love to farm those insects. And so at first you might think, oh, they farm them, that's great, they're eating them, but they're not eating them. They're protecting them from beneficial predators. So when animals like a ladybug or a Tamarixia wasp or surfid fly larvae want to come in and eat these, what we'll call them bad bugs, then the ants will keep the bad bugs out or the good bugs out and protect the bad bugs because the ants want to feed on this honeydew solution. It's really interesting. They also show their studies that show that um, they've documented ants moving insects like scale or aphids around on a tree to spread out the population. So they truly really are farming them, um, but they're protecting them. And so they're um, sort of expanding. It's sort of like they're raising um, uh, livestock and they're expanding their herd. So by keeping ants out of the trees, it allows insects like the surfid fly, like the wasp, the ladybug, the lacewing, the praying mantis, all those great beneficial predators can come in if we keep the ants out. Basically for ant management, um, if uh, the, the best strategy is probably bait stations, commercially prepared bait stations. And those are good because Homemade bait stations tend to, um, it's hard to get the ratio right. And if the water dries out at all, or you don't get the sugar solution, a common one that people make is sugar and borax. And it's really hard to get the sugar solution just right. And ants have a really sensitive taste. And so they know if you don't have it quite right. And then sprays aren't very effective because you're not filling the ants back in the nest. Now, I do want to point out that ants do have a purpose. You know, they're decomposers and they are also pollinators in some cases. So it's not like we wanna eradicate all the ants, but if you have an infestation of scale or mealybug, or like in your citrus, maybe that um, Asian citrus psyllid that we wanna keep out of our trees, then the ants are not helping us out. And in that case, we would wanna make sure we keep ants out of the tree. You can also put up things like physical barriers. There's something called, a product called Tanglefoot, and um, you can do other things to discourage ants. You can put diatomaceous earth. You can do other things. Um, depending on the number of trees you have or plants you have and the amount of ants you have and how windy it is, what the weather's like, there's lots of different um, solutions that might work for you. If you have any questions, you can check out this website. It's the UC Integrated Pest Management website to find out more about ant management. And you can also reach out to our Master Gardener helpline. I do want to note that something we see a lot of times, and I'm seeing it in my grove right now, is this curling and disfiguration of these leaves. And it can look really bad. And um, normally it happens a little bit earlier in the year. It seemed like our summer was long. And normally you would see this around October, and I didn't start to see it until last month. But this is caused by the um, leaf miner moth. So in your vegetables, if you have leaf miner, that's going to be a fly. Um, but in citrus, it's a moth. And it's kind of a cool insect. If you look in this picture, I lose my cursor there. Well, no cursor. But anyways, um, if you look at the picture on the left, you can sort of see tracks in the leaves. And those are um, a tiny larvae that travels around inside of the leaf. So that one is um, a nocturnal moth. And it really doesn't respond too well to, or it doesn't get impacted by most sprays. So even if you're trying to be organic and use things like neem oil, or if you're using more toxic pesticides, this insect um, doesn't feed on the leaf so much as it just lays the eggs on the leaf and moves on. And so most pesticides are not gonna have an impact on this. And this is looking terrible, but it's actually mostly just cosmetic. And so the leaves are still photosynthesizing. And so unless it's really bothering you, just go ahead and leave them on the plant. Probably by January, when it gets a little bit colder, the, then those will, um, leaf miners will become less active. And so this one here on the left, not really that much of a big deal, but on the right, this is the one early symptom of this fatal citrus disease. If you wanna learn more about citrus screening, then you can go to the University of California's Asian Citrus Psyllid website, and we'll drop that in the chat at the end as well. We have a couple other pests, two other pests to mention as part of our December in the garden. We have this at the beginning of all of our presentations, but 
This is definitely something we're facing now, which is there's also a black fig fly in addition to the Asian citrus psyllid. That's another emerging pest. While the Asian citrus psyllid is an established pest. But this one is new to the area and they haven't seen it, I don't believe, in San Bernardino County yet. Um, but it's close by. I think in LA and Orange County, they've seen a couple. So if you have figs and your figs are dropping prematurely, or if you have any um, of like this kind of discoloration instead the figs, and they're asking you to call a uh, helpline and we'll drop this link in the chat as well. And it will also be on our resource sheet. Um, and so they're hoping to um, keep this pest down and we're in the initial stages of just trying to figure out where the pest is. So if you have figs and you're having trouble um, with the fruit dropping prematurely, it might be this fig fly. And so in which case you could reach out to the Master Gardener Helpline if you had questions, but ultimately the CDFA or the California Department of Food and Agriculture would like you to report it so that they can start tracking this fly more carefully. And another fly, oh, my picture is over the words, sorry about that, is that there was a medfly detection in Upland. And this was not too long ago, about a month, yeah, about a month ago. And so, Medflies were found in the North Upland area in San Bernardino County, so on the west end of the valley. And they are right now in the process. It's, that area has been quarantined. If you live within these boundaries, you're not supposed to remove fruit from your property unless you process it. And uh, the quarantine usually lasts about six months. I think they're looking at June to lift the quarantine if their treatment programs are effective. They're gonna do a combination of fruit removal at the sites where they found the medfly. They're gonna do some spray treatments and then they're gonna release sterile male medflies out into the area. They are doing more screening. So if you do live in this area, then um, I wouldn't be surprised if the quarantine expands because they're doing more intensive screening for the medfly. So most likely they're going to find more medflies and the quarantine will expand. In 2019, yeah, about two years ago, then there was a medfly outbreak in DeVore and the same thing happened. It took them about a year, I think, to clear that infestation. And they did some DNA analysis, is my understanding of the medfly. And it looks like it was brought in from Hawaii, either on, you know, with somebody traveling and not declaring their fruits and vegetables properly, or maybe somebody had shipped something. But so the Asian citrus psyllid is an introduced pest, bringing with it uh, the citrus screening disease, which has been devastating worldwide. The medfly, I think if you're older than 30, you probably remember them spraying. I don't think they'll ever go back to spraying with those at Malathion in the middle of the night. Um, but we've definitely had our fair share of problems with medflies. And the black fig fly is another pest to be concerned about. So that's why it's important to make sure you follow recommendations to not um, bring, you know, things into the state or into your area illegally or against recommendation. So that is it for my emerging pest public service announcement. We've been doing these um, month in the garden presentations for about, well, um, well, probably like about a year and a half. And so I was pulling up our last December's presentation and I left some of these bullet points in there because I just thought it was interesting to think about where we were last year. Um, last year, we had a long, hot and dry summer. Um, definitely this year, I think most of us are aware that we've gone into some um, pretty record-breaking drought conditions. Um, but last year, we had all of those fires. And so I noticed that a lot of my fruit was stunted from the heat and the ash and the smoke from the fires last year. So luckily, the fire situation in Southern California hasn't been nearly as bad this year. So that's one blessing. Um, last year, we had only had one rain by December, and this year again, right, we had that rain, when was that, I don't know, time goes by so fast, like, was it three weeks ago or something, 
we did have one rain. Um, so we were starting the winter out dry last year and we didn't really end up getting much rain in the whole year. And um, this year, again, same thing. And so, but we do have this big storm now. I don't know how much rain. I just saw some videos out of Oak Glen and the flooding on those streets. Pretty impressive. Um, they were smart to close down the roads. We didn't have last year, we had uh, some several hot spells in October and November. This year has been a little bit more mild. And last year, I don't remember when we did the December and the garden presentation, but we were predicted to have a rain and it was one big rainstorm we had last year. As uh, conditions get cooler, pest populations in your garden are probably growing. Um, but if we get some really cold weather, like we're predicted, I think tonight to be 35. And as we have the cold weather for the season, that should help reduce pest populations. So we did kind of go from a warm, dry summer into this colder weather. So maybe our pest populations will be low this year because we're starting late, unless anybody wants to jump in with any other observations about December, I think I'll go on. Um, but we're certainly thankful for this rain today, aren't we? Yeah, well, hopefully, as long as you're not getting swept away. A couple big gusts of wind are making me nervous, but I know one of the participants that's on is in Chino, and they said they can see blue sky, her Chino Hills. So now we're starting to look at our chill hours for the year. The chill hours start counting on November 1st. And um, I was going to pull up the chill hours. Let's see, I um, live dangerously here. Um, well, let's, let's go, let's talk about the chill hour. Oh, maybe I messed everything. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Um, so the chill hours are the number of hours that are needed for fruit trees um, for the biological process to create the fruit to occur. So our stone fruits, our subtropicals, like our avocados and our citrus don't need chill hours, but things like blueberries need chill hours and our most of our fruit trees need chill hours. So I should not have left the presentation. I guess I'm not going back into my slides, aren't it? <laughs> um, so when we start counting is November 1st, and then we'll count all the way through the end of February. I did just see something online that said counting through March 30th. I don't know if that's a change that's occurred, but the general rule of thumb is like November 1st to February 15th or February 30th. Um, one of the reasons that they track the chill hours between those two dates or between that general period is that if we get chill hours late in the year, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago in May, we had some really cold weather and that's not gonna help the fruit set. It will actually be harmful to the fruit because the young fruit has already set and it can cause it to fall. If we don't get the chill hours, then it can lead to um, death of the buds, extended bloom for a fruit set. And the longer the bloom is on, then it's more time for pathogens to enter the flowers. If you've ever seen those funky lemons usually um, where there's all different kinds of weird shapes of lemons so it's usually caused by a mite that attacks the bud when it's very when the fruit is very tiny and just starting out so the longer the bloom, bloom time the more um, the higher the chance that the fruit will have damage and in the Inland Empire our two biggest issues with growing fruit trees is um, either people choose varieties that require more chill hours than are provided um, in the area. And we'll look at the chill hours in just a minute or not having adequate pop pollination. So this is a, a, a just kind of a general spread of the different fruit trees chill hour needs. And so you can see things like the fig and the pecan, persimmon and pomegranate only need like a few hundred chill hours. And that's why you'll see almost every year that those fruit trees bear fruit, the uh, persimmon and the pomegranate and the fig especially. Um, but you'll see things like apples and peaches and pears and cherries all need quite a few more hundred chill hours. And so a great place to find these chill hours is on fruitsandnuts.ucdavis.edu. 
and we'll drop that in the chat and I'm gonna try it. Will it let me do anything? Let's see. Ah, my slow computer. Okay, my computer out. Computer either needs more chill hours or it has had too many chill hours. So I'm, let's see if we can figure out what our chill hours are for this year. So it's a good thing if you're not familiar with chill hours to make sure you're thinking about them before you purchase fruit trees. There are a lot of fruit trees available, especially at your box stores, your larger stores like a Home Depot or Lowe's. And sometimes they don't always have fruit trees that are appropriate for your area. The bare root fruit trees are starting to show up um, probably right after the holidays. There may be some out now, um, but make sure you're choosing a variety that is appropriate for your area that you'll get enough chill hours. Okay, we're just gonna try this, my slow, slow computer for like 30 seconds or 20 seconds. I think it's the university pages are having, look at that. I don't know. Okay, well, we're gonna put this in the chat at the end, but you can go here and see how many chill hours we've had for the year. If anybody's able to get on, oh, if anybody's able to get on the website and wants to check the chill hours, you could drop it in the chat. Um, and we're gonna do a couple in January. We'll do a full presentation on growing fruit trees online. And we're also gonna do one at the Chino Hills Library and another one, um, a fruit tree pruning workshop at, in Ontario. So those will be posted on our website. Um, let's see. If they're updating the page. I haven't, I don't think I've seen the new page or if I did, I navigated away from it and went back to the page I'm familiar with. But so here is chilling accumulation models. And so you'll note that they have generally here hours below 45 degrees. And then you'll see hours between 32 and 45 degrees. And um, in places like the Inland Empire, Usually all we worry about is below 45 because we don't get a lot of hours below 32 degrees. But if you live in the mountains or deserts, then it's actually, um, if it gets too cold, that's not helpful to fruit trees. So I'm not gonna open the individual pages, but so like in Pomona, for example, if you're on the west end of the valley, it looks like we've had 68 hours below 45 and 68 hours between 45 and 32 degrees. I think uh, Riverside County is the one that the east end of the valley can kind of look to, not Rivers, yeah, uh, UC Riverside, and they've only had 46 chill hours. So hoping for a cool, cold January and February so that we get good fruit set. If it's this low, we might get a little bit of fruit set, but if it's not at least four or 500 hours, most of our fruit is not gonna do very well. Um, Cause you can see here again, that a lot of the varieties of fruit that we enjoy require several hundred more than we have gotten so far, but it's still early in the season. And so let's see if I can get the slide showed us. So oh, again, speedy here, my computers. So, this was just a slide comparing Riverside and Pomona to see that they're about the same Riverside. It's a little bit warmer. So if you're in the Inland Empire, um, then we just kind of have to, these are, are basically our two choices on that website is Riverside and Pomona. And um, they're pretty close. And then there's a couple of stations up in the high desert. And I think there's one up in Big Bear. Um, Dave Wilson's nursery, I'm not endorsing them as a master gardener, but they have done amazing work to get lower chill hour varieties. The most recent one that I know about, I don't think it's recent, but um, one of the ones that I thought was really interesting in the last couple of years is they come up with a low chill hour um, kiwi. Kiwis take more chill hours than we get down here. And they are a nursery or um, yeah, a nursery that breeds plants looking for lower chill hour requirements. They um, have some nice cherries that don't require as many chill hours. So lots of new varieties 
out of Dave Wilson's nursery. And they also, their website is, they don't sell directly from their website. They sell to, to garden centers. But if you go to their website, they have some great um, fruit tree pruning and care videos. And they also have really great descriptions of fruit flavor. And they talk about whether your fruit trees need a pollinizer, meaning another fruit tree to pollinate it, um, and what type you need to get, um, different elements. If you live in a place that has um, like the high desert where we have really hot summers, then you might want to like look for early harvest varieties of peaches or apricots, um, things that aren't going to sit on the tree too late into the summer. And lots of other information about the fruit. So, um, and also about blueberries. You can see blueberries and um, they also, like I said, are some that require chill hours, which I didn't know until just a few years ago. So actually, if, if you're starting to see, they'll sell bare root fruit trees and they'll sell cane berries, like raspberries and blackberries. And um, they'll also be selling blueberries in the nursery in the next month and a half. And I was surprised when I went to the local nursery um, that there was, they had about four or five varieties, but three of the five or four varieties required seven to 800 chill hours. And that was my local nursery that's 15 minutes from my house. And on a good year, we would get five or 600. And so that blueberry is not going to be successful here. So really good to take a look at that tag. A lot of times it won't tell you how many chill hours the low chill hour varieties are needing, but usually they need around three to 400 and they just call them low chill hour varieties. Blueberries are another one that needs a pollinizer um, unless it's noted that they don't need one. So make sure you read the tags of the fruit trees you're buying or the blueberries that you're buying. Um, and just know also like if you purchase raspberries, raspberries struggle a little bit in the Inland Empire because they don't like our really dry, hot summers and they struggle a little bit with colder winters too. So um, now I have a couple more slides about fruit trees later, but are there any questions um, that you guys have? Uh, that's sort of getting you thinking about the upcoming fruit tree and berry planting season. Um, which will start, you know, kind of after Christmas and into the new year. And I'm guessing in some years, like sometimes the fruit trees go really fast. So if you are thinking about purchasing fruit trees, this is the best time now to be checking out websites like Dave Wilson's Nursery and to get your shopping list going, figuring out what types of trees are you gonna get a multi-grafted tree that has more than one variety? Um, there are a lot of work, but if that's what you're into, they can be interesting. And also a way to grow, um, if you have a small space and you need two trees, like one as a pollinizer. Um, but this is the time to start thinking, planning, where are you gonna put them in your yard? Finding out um, if you want, say, um, a specific type, maybe you'll have to do a little tracking down to find out. So this is all for your stone fruit trees that you'll be planting in the winter. For your subtropicals, um, we'll talk about them in a little bit, but your avocados and your citrus, and best to wait till spring. If we do have a cold winter, then it will really be harsh on those um, subtropical fruits um, or the evergreen fruit trees that don't lose their leaves. This is not the best time to plant them. now. So, for what to maintain, um, I just, it's funny, my fall leaves, at least over here in Claremont, just started falling in the last, gosh, it's only been like three to four weeks. Usually they fall a lot earlier, but usually I have a nice um, colorful carpet of leaves for, uh, the, you know, right after Halloween, and they were late this year, but um, if you've had any issues with, um, uh, like uh, funguses or anything, then you might want to rake up your leaves. You can compost them. And um, there's a little bit of debate in the scientific community. As a master gardener, we take lots of continuing education and we're always reading up on new information. And um, I had always learned when I was younger that like for controlling things like fire blight, that you want to keep around your trees tidy. Um, but I have heard other research to the contrary that says that 
the decomposition of leaves around the base of your trees helps create an environment that manages those outbreaks. So if you have questions about to rake or not to rake, you can reach out to our helpline or do a little research on your own. Um, there's some interesting information out there. I think it's fairly new, um, but and, and not everybody agrees on it. But I have backed off a little bit on my raking. Um, you can clean up your garden beds. I actually have a tomato plant. It's a volunteer. And I just saw on uh, Saturday that it's got some little tomatoes on it. Um, but it is growing out of the side of my compost pile. And so I've uh, cleared up all my summer vegetables. If you haven't done that by now, then this is a great time to do it. Um, you want to watch out for cold weather. If it's going to be below 32, then you're going to want to protect those with either plants with either frost cloth or um, some kind of protection. Uh, after the rain is usually so when we have cloud cover and the rain, uh, the temperature is is kind of moderated. I don't know if you noticed it, but it's usually a little bit warmer when it's raining. And then I think it will be Wednesday night for us that we're going to have clear skies. And those are usually really cold nights. I know tonight we'll be down in my area down to about 35. Um, so not not cold enough to damage things like my citrus but maybe cold enough to damage some of my more tender herbs that have been, my basil has actually been doing really well. And so I'm gonna go out and harvest it all before it dies um, from the cool weather. And if you have any succulents or anything that you're worried about, um, then you might wanna bring those in or put those under trees after the rain. Um, you can prune your non-flowering uh, trees and sh shrubs while they're dormant. I don't think I have a slide about camellias, um, but the camellias, maybe I do, but the camellias, they've all got blossoms on them right now. So you're not gonna wanna prune those. You'll prune them after they've bloomed in a probably about a month or so. Um, and then you wanna clean up, well, here you go again, cleaning up de debris around your fruit trees to prevent disease. There seems to be the jury seems to be out on that depending on who you ask. So I would say um, make a choice that seems appropriate that, that is with uh, in keeping in with what you think is the right thing to do. If you've had some sort of mystery disease on your tree, you might wanna reach out to our helpline and find out if that's something that you should be cleaning up or um, should be more concerned about. You can be mulching that with all this rain we have, I am pretty sure that the weeds are going to just sprout like crazy in the next three weeks, you know, getting that water they've been waiting for. And so if um, you're thinking about mulching, now would be a great time to mulch to hold all that moisture in. And mulch is also going to help uh, to keep your soil warm with the cooler temperatures that are hopefully ahead. Um, if you have any, um, well, this is another thing that I see, I, I, as, as I said, as master gardeners, we're always trying to keep up to date on the newest information. And so if you have bird feeders, you wanna make sure you're keeping them clean and filled. I know there was a bird feed, was it salmonella? There was some sort of outbreak in bird feed and they were recommending not putting bird food out. Uh, and that was about, was that a month and a half or two months ago? Um, so if you have any questions about keeping birds healthy, then you might want to go to what is it like Audubon Society and see. I don't know if anybody has any links related to birds in the, um, that they wanted to drop into the chat. But definitely if you do have bird feeders, um, keep them clean and keep the bird seed stocked. And bird feed stations often become uh, stations for rats. So you might want to keep that in mind as well. Okay. And I noticed that up until this rain, I actually had a bunch of, from the previous rain we had, I guess it was probably about a month ago, it was enough to trigger all of my wildflowers to bloom and the helianthus, the, the native sunflower had bloomed and gone to seed. And so I had an incredible amount of seed in my yard that I could see the birds feeding on up until just a day and a half ago when we got this rain. And the rain is probably throwing a lot of those seeds to the ground. Um, so just keep the birds in mind. And then going back to raking the leaves, another thing if, to think about when you're raking is maybe leaving a part of your yard unraked 
for the native bees and others that live in the um, leaf litter, including things like spiders and other bugs that you may not be big fans of, but um, are part of a healthy ecosystem and they eat lots of the bugs that, that we don't like. Um, but even though we're having rain right now, they're actually, what was that today? There's a, some really good presentations going on from the University of California on a statewide level about fire mitigation and fire safety. And so if you live in a high fire danger area, just remember that even though it's getting into the winter and we are having rain right now, you do wanna keep the leaves tidied up and keep that fire danger in mind. Um, when it comes to your fruits and veggies, if you have any summer veggies at this point, even though like my basil was looking amazing like three or four days ago, I think with this cold weather that we're gonna have tonight and probably tomorrow night, I think it's gonna take those down. And even if they do survive, sometimes they become um, a place for pests to overwinter. So for your annual plants, um, I would encourage you in your vegetable garden or even your flowers, um, pull those and hopefully compost them and then that will help keep those disease populations down for when you start a spring garden. Ideally, when you are doing a winter garden, you would have cleared these summer vegetables out uh, probably like a month or two ago so that the pests from your summer garden aren't um, hanging out and attacking your winter garden. You wanna watch out. I noticed after that last rain we had, even though it was really cold, then I saw a big uh, outbreak of mosquitoes about a week and a half or two weeks later. And so you wanna watch for standing water after the rain. I was learning from vector control at an event a couple months ago that that striped leg mosquito with the white stripes on its legs, Addies or Aedes mosquito, that daytime mosquito, it's able to lay its eggs. Like if you fill up your pots, and you let them fill up to the brim and then you let the water soak into the pot, that edge of water where the, cause they're, they're designed, I get a design. They're mosquitoes that thrive in flood plains. And so they do very well if you would like fill up your pot once a week or every couple of days and um, have that water just come up to the brim. They'll lay their eggs right on the brim there. They're really tricky, very hard to manage for us gardeners, but the best we can do to keep conditions dry, um, or the best thing we can do is try to keep conditions dry and not leave standing water. But we do have to water our plants, otherwise there is no garden, but darn that mosquito. Going back to our fruit trees, we have a link um, that talks about the calendar of care um, under the Home Orchard website through the University of California. We've already talked about uh, planting fruit trees that that planting should go on in January and into February. So those will start to be in the market soon. Um, in January and February, you can do your fruit tree pruning with the exception of apricots and cherries. Those are susceptible to, what is it, euphorbia? No, um, uh, fungal disease. And if they get, if they're damp, so you wanna avoid pruning your apricots and cherries this time of year. And we will have, um, we've uh, finished our fruit tree workshops that were going on this month. Those we did in person at Highland Library, but we will have more fruit tree pruning and care workshops in January. So look on our website for those. The citrus, um, you wanna cut back on the water, but it has been really dry. So if we did this presentation last week, I was still watering my trees. I wasn't watering them nearly as much. I had cut it back about a third or I had cut it back to about a third the water. So in the summertime, I would water every seven to 10 days. And in the last two months, I've been watering at least once a month, if not more often, because it was so dry. And so I think if, if this is all the rain we get for a while, this could probably carry you over if you don't have small citrus trees and it doesn't get too warm, then you probably don't need a water again until the first of the year, I would say. The citrus is probably gonna be flushing out. That's this, the term for this new growth. And that's what the uh, Asian citrus psyllid, that pest we talked about at the beginning, 
it really likes that new growth. Um, you know, it's a sign of a healthy tree. It's what we want to see, um, but it will attract pests. So you want to keep an eye on your tree. For your citrus and avocados as well, just prune them as needed to remove the dead and diseased woods, wood and to cut back any suckers. And then it's too late in the year to fertilize um, just because if you fertilize now and we get some really cold weather, this new growth here will die back um, from the cold weather. And this is this is this new growth happens when we get cooler weather, but it also happens in response to fertilizer. The tree is happy and it sends out this new growth. So if you haven't fertilized by now, then you should go ahead and wait until at least mid-February um, to fertilize your citrus trees. And then these are these rootstock suckers that you want to cut back. And you'll cut those back any time of year. They'll definitely take over the tree. They're really characteristic. They have a long thorn and they have often a different type of leaf as well. This is a trifoliate leaf, a leaf with three little leaves on the end. So you always want to cut those back, especially right now if you have any new fruit trees where you have created like a berm. Well, that's a terrible color. I mean, it's a fine color. I just can't see it. Um, so if you have created like a berm, uh, this is also true of like if you've planted any roses or any ornamental trees. If you've created this type of berm, you know, like a donut that goes around your tree, it may be filling with standing water and, you know, with this rain. And so you might want to open up the berm and just make sure that that uh, rain water is able to drain out, that the tree is not sitting in water for too long. The soil is pretty dry, so probably that's not going to happen, but let's see how much rain we get. And if you live in the south side of the valley or the east side of the valley where you have that heavy clay soil, then that may be something more important that you need to do. And so just, just break it open and let the water drain out and you can build it back up when you need to water, um, hold that water in in the spring or the summer. Um, if you haven't uh, thought about saving seeds before, um, it's most of the summer uh, flowers, especially with this rain, most of the summer flowers and summer vegetables and fruits have uh, gone to seed quite some time ago. And you probably missed your opportunity to save seeds from the summer season. But think about seed saving from your cool season veggie garden. And we'll do a couple classes about that. We do a seed saving class every month. And we'll definitely do one about seed saving from your cool season veggie garden. So check out our website for that. For seed saving from stone fruits or citrus or avocados, it's usually not recommended. Sometimes you can um, grow those things successfully, but they are grown on a rootstock that is there for disease resistance and hardiness. And also the flowers are really heavily pollinated. So it's hard to tell what you're going to get. But if you really determine to seed save from your fruit trees, you can go ahead and try it. Um, just know that it may or may not be successful. And it usually takes about seven years to figure that out. So it just depends on how committed you are. I saw on social media the other day, the recommendation um, like as a, a gorilla gardener is to like um, throw, say said, save all your peach pits and fruit pits and throw them out of your window <laughs> as you drive around neighborhoods so that fruit trees will grow um, on their own and we can re we re tree the neighborhood. And in Southern California, I mean, there's lots of issues with that in terms of introducing invasive species or whatever, pests or whatever. But in Southern California, we just don't have usually enough rain to even facilitate that. So please don't throw your pits out of your window. Um, I, I don't recommend it. So, and let's see, oh, it's 5.04. I didn't realize we were over the time and we started late. Just a few more slides. Um, and so what to fertilize? For what to fertilize? Um, oh, my computer. Don't give up on me, computer. Uh, for what to fertilize this month, then, uh, if you have any vegetables growing, then vegetables, you don't fertilize them. Uh, let's see, you don't fertilize them when you're planting vegetable seeds, but when they get about four to six inches tall, you could fertilize them. And um, 
there we go. So in our fertilizer, you know, we have our nitrogen, our phosphorus, and our potassium, our NPK. The nitrogen is for leaf growth, and the potassium is for oops, is for making flowers. And so that may be something that you're wanting to do in a little bit, but probably right now, um, most things aren't needing fertilizer. And the phosphorus is for root growth. I'm going to skip over this slide. It's a cool chart about nutrient availability at different pHs. Um, but just because of the time, I'm not going to go too much in depth into it. But basically, most of our soil is around seven to seven and a half. Most potting soil is around six to six and a half. Um, and those are the ideal pH conditions where most nutrients are available. You know, um, blueberries require a low pH or an acidic environment um, to thrive. And if they are not in a low pH environment, then they'll get yellowing of the leaves. And that's due to an iron deficiency. And you can see that iron is very, avail very available at a low pH. And as the pH gets higher, it's not available. And so when you're seeing that yellowing on blueberries um, in response to soil not being acidic enough, it's actually an iron deficiency. If you're interested in planting blueberries and you wanna learn more about acidifying soil, there's a couple of great publications one from Oregon State and one from uh, the California Master Gardener Program. Learn more about acidifying your soils. And that's, for the most part, we don't need to do that. Um, in Southern California, most of our vegetables will do pretty well. But if you are having um, problems, you might want to reach out to our helpline and we can see if that's the issue. But if you are going to grow blueberries, then usually you do need to acidify your soil. Um, you can apply chelated iron to azaleas, gardenias, and camellias if the leaves are yellowing between the veins. And that's actually due to the same thing. Camellias, azaleas, and gardenias are acid-loving plants, and they like that lower pH because it allows them to take up the nitrogen. If you have annual flowers, um, then you can give them a uh, fertilizer about once a month. And as a general rule of thumb, if you have things in pots, and you usually fertilize them about half as much and do it about twice as often so you don't burn them. So that applies to your vegetables or your flowers or your roses. Um, if they're in pots, you add about half as much and do it about twice as often. Um, and then you don't wanna fertilize dry plants. So if your plants were a little bit dry before this rain and you think that they need fertilizer, I would give them a couple days to respond to this rain and so that make sure they're nice and um, well watered. Um, you can um, use a dormant oil spray on your deciduous fruit trees and your roses. These help to get rid of overwintering insects. So we might not see a lot of aphids or mites or scale in our fruit trees, although I'm actually seeing some pretty active scale right now in my citrus trees. But you can spray them with a dormant oil spray um, after the leaves have fallen. Um, you can spray the citrus with that dormant oil spray or uh, some kind of like insecticidal oil spray. Just want to make sure that it's not too hot, but I think if you look at the calendar or the weather for the next month, it doesn't seem like we're going to have some really hot spells. And just remember that all beneficial, um, that all insecticidal sprays, whether they're organic or not, do harm um, or impact all insects that get sprayed. So just be careful about not spraying or try to avoid spraying while things are in bloom. And our UC integrated pest management page has lots of great strategies on how to deal with your pests without, um, with least toxic methods. I'm just gonna go through kind of like in a list form the what to plant since we are at 509 already. Um, you can, uh, choose and plant your camellias and azaleas. As they are starting to flower, they're kind of in their most dormant phase. And so if you plant them now, um, and then they'll sort of take off right after bloom. Your bare root roses should be starting to show up in the nursery pretty soon, along with your fruit trees. And um, consider choosing a living Christmas tree. Although I know this year we don't have a lot of choices um, for Christmas trees, but consider choosing a living Christmas tree. And you can cart it in and out every year. Um, I can see lots of logistical issues with that, but it's always a great idea to dream of. 
um, your native plant. If you haven't planted your native plant, it's not too late. February is usually the coldest time of year and some of the native plants might struggle being planted in February. But in general, the planting period is October to they say May, but really like March and April are kind of the um, end of the better time to plant them. So if you haven't planted, planted native plants, then it's not too late. Yeah, and some of your more tender plants though might, if we have some really cold weather, um, if they're just newly planted, they might struggle just a little bit and need some extra support. Planting them now allows them to establish before the heat of the summer and it's not too late if we have our coldest weather in February and it's kind of even the way it's been the last week or so where it's cool but not really cold then they should be fine. Um, once established then they don't need a lot of supplemental water and don't prefer fertilizer and if you plant them now and we have at least a couple of rains really good chance that they'll be established, they say, and, and have a good root structure before the heat of next summer. Usually if you plant your plants after like February or March, they need some extra care during the summer, that first season. Um, don't add mulch. I think I said that already. Um, some of them actually don't, they prefer not to have mulch and don't add fertilizer, that's in there twice. Herbs are a great thing to plant. Most of them can be planted year round. I would say the only thing right now that won't do really well is uh, basil and my dill has finished for the year. Um, but there's a lot of herbs you can plant right now. So give those a try. You can do this stack system where you can plant lots of herbs in a small area. So um, give that a try as well. Here's a couple of different um, versions of this. This one here on the right, it looks really sad, um, but it sat out in my driveway for more than a month, I think it was, and I had forgotten to water it. And as the plants are stacked, then it, I mean, the pots are stacked, it allows the roots to sort of grow toward the center. And all of these plants popped right back. If they had been in an individual pot and not stacked, they probably wouldn't have come back. You can uh, plant or uh, buy poinsettias and amaryllis, calendulas, Iceland poppies, pansies, Christmas poppies, and primroses. The poinsettias, you're going to want to stay in a sunny, warm location. You want to water them thoroughly, but do not leave them sitting in water. Standing water is probably the number one way that poinsettias go down. So you want to not let them um, dry out too much but uh, don't let them sit in standing water. It's not too late to plant your narcissus and your daffodils. You could probably still plant hyacinths and tulips as long as they've gone through their chilling period that they've needed. Um, and there's probably lots of end of year bulb sales. I bought 550 daffodils as part of my gopher annoyance program. Uh, gophers don't like daffodils mostly, although maybe they'll learn to love them, but I bought 550 um, for probably 50% off. That's some really nice online nurseries, so check those sales out. Um, you can prune for holiday greens. There's holly and juniper, pittosporum, podocarpus, pyracantha, just watch your fingers because they're so sharp, and toyon. Um, they could have a winter grooming, and then you can use those for holiday decorations. Whoops. Uh, your vegetables, I already mentioned that they have um, some uh, probably berries coming in the nursery. I haven't seen them yet, so it's probably a little bit too early. You may also be seeing artichokes and asparagus. Uh, grapes will also be in the nursery pretty soon. Kiwi fruit struggles, but they are those low chill hour kiwi fruits. You need a male and a female. So do a little research before you're going to plant kiwis, but it can be done. Um, and just make sure that when you buy them, you don't leave them in the pots too long um, because they're, they're not really packed in soil usually. They're packed in like, um, uh, it's kind of like a coconut coir, but they're not designed to stay in those pots for too long. So make sure you keep the roots moistened and get them planted as soon as possible. You could be planting your cool season veggies. Um, and so, We've got, what is our cast of characters? Beets and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, definitely could be doing carrots, cauliflower, 
Celery likes warm soil. So if you haven't planted your celery, it might struggle a little bit. It probably would have been better to do it earlier. You might be able to get away with celery. Chives, you really can plant year round here in Southern California. Collards, endive, fava, kale, kohlrabi, leeks, and lettuce. And lettuce can be planted year round if you keep it in the shade in the summer. Mustard, onions um, can also still be planted, parsley, parsnips, peas, um, great time to plant peas, radishes, rutabagas, spinach, Swiss chard, and turnips. So those are our cast of characters that could be planted right now. If you've got a lawn, make sure you've turned off your sprinklers um, or any other sprinklers that are on since we're getting all that rain. Might want to consider if you didn't plant a winter garden, you might want to consider planting um, some cover crops, either for erosion control or to help improve your soil structure. This is, this is a picture from Los Angeles of some really beautiful fava, fava beans in a school. Um, and so I want to try something like this really pretty color and really beautiful foliage, very dark purple. Um, and there's a great website um, offered uh, or information from Cal Flora um, called the eVeg Guide, and they have all kinds of information on cover crops. And if you're in the mountains, um, I kind of think like, you know, you, they, they recommend early harvest varieties, but if anybody is joining from the mountains, I suspect you are under snow right now. And so you might want to try gardening in a cold frame or something like that. Um, I do know people who garden year round up in the mountains, but it definitely takes some effort. You wanna make sure you keep your fuel ladders trimmed and maintain your zones around your house for defensible space. Um, start thinking about spring. I know that in the mountains, most of the spring planting is done in May, so it's not exactly spring, but you can always plan ahead. And if you have questions about vegetable gardening in the mountains, we do have a handful of master gardeners up there. So reach out to our helpline if you have questions. Um, here's a couple different ideas for keeping your plants warm with frost cloth, retractable frost cloth. Um, and you just wanna make sure if you're using anything that's heavy or has plastic, um, that you're airing these things out on a regular basis so that you don't build up um, waterborne pathogens in there. And even with the frost cloth, it's a good idea to take those things off periodically. If you're in the high desert, gosh, I was up there yesterday, so windy. Um, and so creating any kind of wind barrier, I think wind is, you have the extremes of the heat and the cold, but the wind makes vegetable planting so challenging up there. But you can grow cool season veggies up there. So give it a try and reach out to our helpline. Um, Check out our website for upcoming classes. Um, and uh, here's our resources. I'm gonna exit out of the presentation because, oh, like 18 minutes. Well, see, I had an hour presentation and then I started like 15 minutes late. So I'm gonna drop these resources in the chat. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer the questions. I hope we gave you sort of a little snapshot of what you could be doing in your garden right now. I would say for the next couple of days and um, just enjoy that we got some free water, maybe go check for down branches. And if you do have a, an area like uh, a vegetable garden area, try to avoid doing too much stepping around the, the roots of your trees or your um, vegetable beds or in your raised beds because the soil is really damp and you can really press it down. Up in my area, um, it's pretty sandy soil, but if so, it probably wouldn't be a big deal, but just avoid tramping around in your garden. Is that a word? Stamping around in your garden, stomping around, <laughs> stomping around in your garden um, so that you avoid um, really compressing the soil. So Think for the next couple of days, just enjoy that. Think about getting your fruit trees. Think about pruning your fruit trees. Check out our upcoming uh, classes. So we'll be posting our January classes over the next 10 days or so. So be on the lookout for what we have to offer in the new year. We have one more presentation this year online uh, about growing strawberries this Saturday. 
But if this is your last presentation with us for the rest of the year, and I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us. And if you have ideas, people have sent us ideas to our helpline about classes they'd like us to offer. And we do our best. And so far I've been able to accommodate all those requests. We're doing um, more with our YouTube channel. So in addition to posting our one hour presentations, we're also gonna start adding some shorter three minute videos and five minute videos and 15 minute videos. So we've got a team working on getting those things posted. So check out our YouTube channel. You can find it through our website and I think um, under recent presentations and I think Debbie also dropped it in the chat earlier. But thank you so much. And uh, don't be shy to reach out to our helpline if you have any gardening questions. I'll put that link in the chat as well. And with that, I think that's it for me for today. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording and thank you so much for staying on a little bit late.